So welcome everyone and welcome to AATRN. Um, the speaker today is Patrick Schneider and he's going to tell us about topological methods in discrete geometry. All right, thanks a lot. And uh, thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, just a small technical questions. Do you see my mouse if I move it around? All right, just in case that I'm pointing at something, I wanna make sure that you actually see at what I'm pointing. Yeah, so thanks a lot for the invitation. And I thought long about what I should talk about today because I mean, it's the seminar on applied topology, which is kind of wide and there's a lot of different applications. And so I thought, I'm just going to use this time to showcase a bunch of applications that are very close to my interest and very close to my research, which are a bunch of applications in discrete geometry. So this is more going to be kind of a survey style talk. I'm going to show several different results, some of them classical, some of them quite new, um, mainly going to focus on two different areas. And I hope that everybody can take at least something from this talk, be it some nice open problem, or some example that you might be able to use whenever you're teaching topology in some introductory lecture or something like that. Um, if you have any questions, complaints, suggestions, whatever, feel free to interrupt me at every point. All right, so first of all, what, what is discrete geometry? Um, as discrete geometers, we care about discrete objects that might appear in a geometric setting. So for example, points, we care a lot about arrangements of points or hyperplanes. There's also the entire study of polytope theory, which falls into the realm of discrete geometry. So it's a pretty wide topic. Um, yeah, and there's a bunch of uh, areas where topology have found applications. So for example, the whole problem of mass partitions where you're given some masses usually in Euclidean space. And let's say, for example, you want to partition them fairly using, let's say, a hyperplane. So here, usually the partitioning objects are the discrete things. Um, there's a whole area of helitype theorems where you're given a bunch of sets and you kind of want to find the intersection patterns of those. Very related are also Tverberg type theorems where you have a bunch of points and you want to partition these points in such that the convex hulls have certain intersection patterns. There's problems where you want to inscribe certain things into polytopes. There's embedding problems of, let's say, finite simplicial complexes and a lot of more things where topology can really be helpful. And I guess the first and probably most important takeaway here is that there is an amazing book about a lot of these things that I can warmly recommend to everybody. It's uh, Yerka Matuszek's book, Using the bosuk ulam Theorem, which really highlights a lot of different problems and in the end solves a lot of them using the bosuk ulam Theorem or variants of those. And at least for me personally, this was kind of the gateway to topological methods in discrete geometry. And it's really a beautiful book uh, written in a way that undergrads can work through it. So that's a really nice book. If you don't know it yet, you should take a look at it. All right, so in this talk, I'm mainly gonna focus on the first two areas. So mass partitions and Helly type theorems. And for each of them, I'm gonna look at a very classical result and then kind of showcase one particular direction in which people have tried to kind of generalize this and find variants and new proofs. So let me start with mass partitions. And I guess the most famous theorem there that probably most of you, uh, one way or the other, have heard about is the so-called ham sandwich theorem. So ham sandwich theorem, it's uh, I think from the 30s by Banach Steinhaus, although there is some discussion as to the exact origin. But it says that if we have D mass distributions in RD, then there is a hyperplane that simult simultaneously bisects all of them. So what is a mass distribution? I don't want to go into the formal details, but it's some measure. Um, it's a Borel measure. And just think of it that way that for this talk, whenever we have some map that we would like to be continuous, it is going to be continuous by definition of mass distribution. Yeah, so how do you illustrate this? Well, let's say we have these two blobs here and the measure is just the area of that, then these are in the plane. So we have two of them, then we can find a hyperplane. So that's an affine linear, uh, sorry, an affine subspace of one dimension lower. So here that will be a line. 
such that on both sides of this line, we have the same measure for both colors, right? And why is it called the ham sandwich theorem? Well, the standard thing is, well, if you have a two-dimensional sandwich that consists of bread and of ham, and you want to share this with your friend, so kind of both of you should get the same amount of bread and the same amount of ham, then the ham sandwich theorem is going to tell you that you can always do this by cutting just once with a straight cut. And that actually doesn't depend on how exactly you built this sandwich. You can be a really terrible chef and suck at making sandwiches. You might have even forgotten the ham in the fridge. Still going to work. All right. And I guess many of you might have seen a proof of this before, but the proof of the ham sandwich theorem or one proof is very topological. And it goes as follows. So again, the illustrations are going to be in 2D, but the ideas generalize. So we have our measures or our masses. And we're going to look at uh, possible sets of bisecting hyperplanes. And we're going to parameterize them using a sphere, namely a D minus, no, a D sphere. And so for any point on the D sphere, which we think of as embedded in R to the D plus one, we just define these two half spaces, which are just, well, the solutions to these linear equations. Once we take the positive side of the hyperplane that we get, once we take the negative side. And so for each point, we're going to get these two sides of some hyperplane. And I mean, this is continuous. So if you just move it a bit, then we also move these things a bit. And it also has the nice property that if we look at the antipodal point on the sphere, then all that we do is, well, we just switch plus the positive side and the negative side, right? Because we put a minus in front of everything. So we can now define a function for every point on the sphere, which is just, well, we look at how much measure we have in the positive side. And we do this for each single mass and we subtract the mass on the negative side, right? So if we have D masses, then this is going to be a D variate function. So it's going to be a function from the D sphere to R to the D. And well, what would bisecting mean? It would mean that we get a zero, right? So if we want to have the same amount of mass on both sides for each single mass, then all of these, uh, all of these functions should be zero, right? So we have this function from the D sphere to R to the D and we want that it has a zero. And we further have a very nice property of this function, which is that, well, this antipodality comes in, right? So going from one point on the sphere to the antipodal point, all that we did was exchange the positive and the negative side. So we're exactly gonna get a minus in front of the, front of the function. So we get an antipodal function from the D sphere to R to the D. So there is this famous theorem that I already mentioned before, the bosuk ulam theorem, which tells us that there is always going to be a zero. And as I just argued, this zero is indeed going to be the bisecting hyperplane that we were looking for. All right, I guess many of you have seen this proof before, but I mean, there's a natural question, right? I'm personally, not always in the mood for just a ham sandwich. Sometimes I would like to have a pizza. And pizzas have a tendency to have more ingredients than just the two. So here I have a pizza in the plane and that one already has four ingredients, right? The dough, some cheese, some olives, and some tomatoes. And so you can ask yourself, well, can you do more? Can you share more ingredients if you're allowed to use some more complicated cuts? And this is kind of one area of research in mass partition theorems that people are still very actively looking into, where you're given some rules of what cuts or what types of cuts you're allowed to use. And you want to figure out, OK, how many ingredients can I share simultaneously using these rules? Um, uh, so one way how you can get Kind of more general results is very straightforward and it's by so-called lifting methods. I'm going to showcase one result there, which is quite simple. So for example, if we look at the plane and we have some mass near these just four red points in the plane, we can kind of lift everything up to the unit parabolic. 
right? So we are in one dimension higher. And the unit parabolaid has the nice property that any plane or in general hyperplane that intersects it, if we project the intersection back down, we're gonna get a sphere. And so already from this thing, what you can do is you can take your masses on R to the D, you lift them to the unit paraboloid, and then you take a ham sandwich cut there, and you're gonna get a sphere after projecting down. So we get the following result quite easily that if we are allowed to use a sphere instead of just a hyperplane, we can do one mass more. Right. Where, of course, the sphere, it could be degenerate. So a hyperplane is also a sphere of infinite radius. So these are kind of very straightforward and they don't use any new topological ideas. You can also um, do something very similar, but kind of do this lifting in a topological sense. So just apply the same proof strategy to in a slightly different way. So you can do this, for example, with the polynomial ham sandwich theorem which just says that if we have some uh, n plus d choose n minus one many mass distributions in R to the d, then we can always simultaneously bisect them using an algebraic surface of degree n. So kind of the zero set of some uh, polynomial equation. And you can really just do the same proof that you did for the ham sandwich theorem, but instead of looking at linear functions, you're just going to look at polynomials. And again, you're going to have a positive and a negative part. You're going to have continuity. You're going to have this antipodality and this weird number, n plus d choose n minus one. That's just the number of coefficients that you have in general, right? And so you immediately, by the same idea, get these more complicated cuts and significantly more measures, but also significantly more complicated ways of cutting. Uh, maybe one corollary that is kind of illustrative in the plane. If you plug in the numbers and you want to have a conic section, so algebraic surface, or uh, not a surface in this case, but just algebraic um, solution of degree two, so a conic section, then you can actually do five masses instead of the two that you could with just the linear one. Um, yeah, and so this led us to think about, okay, we have conic sections. So what, what if we try to add some more degeneracies? So for example, can we make this into two lines? Because two lines are just a degenerate conic section, right? The conic section, it can be a hyperbola, but then you can start switching things around. And at some point you might get two lines before it turns into another hyperbola you again get two parallel lines before it turns into an ellipsoid, right? So two lines are also a conic section, but kind of a degenerate one. And it turns out that you can really nicely describe this degeneracy. So a conic is degenerate if and only if this uh, certain determinant here vanishes. And well, it's a determinant of a three by three matrix. So it is, I mean, it's continuous but it also has the antipodality, right? So if you put a minus in front of all the values, then we're also gonna get a minus in front of the determinant. So what you can do now is, okay, you can say you play the entire proof of this polynomial ham sandwich theorem, but you sacrifice one of the masses and you plug in this determinant instead. And then the fact that everything is zero means that this determinant is gonna be zero and you're going to get as your solution two lines because these are the determinate, uh, degenerate conic sections. So that's something that we figured out only a few years ago, actually. Um, and we were able to prove together with Luis Barba that in the plane, four mass distributions can be simultaneously bisected using two lines. So kind of very applicable to the pizza that I had before. So if this is your pizza with four ingredients that you want to share, it actually suffices to only cut twice. And then your friend may maybe would get the blue part, you would get the green part in this picture and you would all get the same amount of each ingredient. So why did we care about this? Well, turns out there is this very nice conjecture or I, I like it um, by Stefan Langemann 
which says that any n times d mass distributions in R to the d can be simultaneously bisected by n hyperplanes. So let me maybe say what now simultaneously bisected by n hyperplanes means. So if you have n hyperplanes in R to the d, they are going to determine some arrangement with cells. And there's a very natural two coloring of these cells, just like you can see in the picture to the left, where kind of cells that share uh, a hyperplane are going to get different colors. Right? And then you have kind of this chessboard style coloring. And the conjecture is that, well, if you get one color, your friend gets the other color. There's actually always a way of placing n hyperplanes in such a way that this simultaneously bisects n times d mass distributions. So if we put n equals one, then that's just the ham sandwich theorem. So that works. Um, but there's not many other cases actually where this is known. So in fact, uh, our theorem from 2017 was kind of the first known, I mean, not non-trivial, but not unknown case of that. Um, there has been some progress since. So by now this conjecture has been proven to be true whenever the dimension D is a power of two but it's open in any other setting. So for example, if you put in n equals two, so two hyperplanes in R to the three, so two planes in R3, this conjecture would say that you can always find two cuts in R3 such that you can simultaneously bisect six masses. And that statement is still open. So yeah, even these very natural generalizations turn out to be quite tricky. And yeah, so far we haven't found any approach that generalizes to these kind of things. So that is my first open problem for those of you that like these kind of things. All right, but so far we have still only used the bosu coulomb theorem. Um, but you can kind of generalize this entire approach, which brings me to the so-called configuration space test map framework, which is a uh, framework that has been introduced to kind of prove mass partition theorems. And it has been applied successfully in many cases. And the general idea really just follows the proof of the ham sandwich theorem that we have seen, but generalizes it in several ways. So the first step here is you want to look at your potential partitioning objects and you want to somehow parameterize this space. So in our, uh, for the ham sandwich, we were looking at hyperplanes, and we found this nice parameterization of potential hyperplanes by these points on the sphere. Then the next step is you kind of want to define a map that measures the imbalance, where the zeros should be the solutions. So this is called the test map. So that's this uh, map that we had before, which was like the mass in the positive side minus the mass in the negative side. And then, of course, a zero means that you have the same mass on both sides. But this can also be generalized for more. There's uh, papers that do this for not bisections, but like partitions into more than two parts. And still, they always define it in such a way that the zeros are going to be the solutions. Then next, you want to find some symmetry in your space. So in the in the case of the ham sandwich theorem, we had this antipodality from the sphere that translated to an antipodality in the test map and also the goal space. So what we got was a so-called equivariant map. In our case, it was a C2 equivariant map, but there could be other groups acting, right? So in the end, you want to get some group action both on the space on the, and on the target space and on the map such that this group action really behaves nicely with respect to the map, so a so-called G equivariant map. And then you want to use some methods from equivariant topology to show that this G equivariant map that you found must have a zero. And that is kind of the general framework that people have applied. And of course, Bosuk Ulam being kind of the most famous result in equivariant topology, but there are many others. And very often, if you do these kind of things, you end up at places where you get some map and then you don't find any papers where it has been shown that such a map cannot exist. And there's 
by now a bunch of very nice techniques that one can use to kind of show these generalized Bosuk Ulam theorems. So there's some index theory approaches and so on and so forth. However, in many other cases, you might find out that actually these kind of maps exist, in which case your original statement might still hold because the maps that exist just cannot come from the setting you're in. But in that case, you cannot really say a lot. So yeah. Um, yeah, I now want to kind of highlight one of these very recent uh, equivariant topological results, which have turned out to be very powerful. So many um, previous results in mass partitions have found easier proof by this very general Bosukulam type result. And it's um, about Stiefel manifolds. So a Stiefel manifold is just the space of orthogonal K frames in R to the N. So it has uh, two parameters N and K where N is the dimension of the ambient space and K is the number of vectors that we look at. So for example, we could think of three orthogonal vectors in R to the four. So that would be V four three. Um, now, in order to use equivariant topology, we kind of want to have some group action on this space. And uh, I guess probably the most natural action that you can have on this space is a C2 to the K action. So we have K vectors and we can just invert each one of those. And so each inversion itself is going to be C2. And so we have K of those. So this Stiefel manifold has a very natural C2 to the K action. Um, we also have a target space and that is just a product of Euclidean spaces of certain dimensions. So the first one has dimension n minus one, the second one dimension n minus two, and the kth one has dimension n minus k. Also this space has a very natural C2 to the k action by just taking the action on every single space. So for example, yeah, we, we can have to see two to the K action where the first one just inverts the on the first Euclidean space, the second action just inverts the second Euclidean space and so on. And so the maps that we're gonna look at are really the ones that are equivariant with respect to these two actions. So kind of if we invert the red vector, in the Stiefel manifold, we're going to invert this red point in the first Euclidean space in our target space, and so on. So these are well-defined C2 to the K equivariant maps. And the theorem by Chan Chen Frick and Hall from 2019 says that every such map must have a zero. Um, I really like this result. I mean, you can sit down and think about it and you will figure out that you can actually prove Bosukulam from that, but it's much, much more general than this. And you can also prove some nice mass partition theorems by that. And I'm gonna show you one small application of this that we have discovered recently. So that's something that we actually only did a few weeks ago. It's not yet published. I just want to warn you, so um, take it with a certain grain of salt, but we're very confident in it. So it's something that I did with Pablo Sobedon, and we were able to show that any d plus one master distributions in R to the d, we can simultaneously bisect by a hypercube. So it's very similar to this result that we have seen before by spheres, but instead of a sphere, we're going to look at a hypercube. And then all of these lifting methods um, uh, or at least we didn't find any easy lifting method to prove this. But using this other um, Bosukulam type result, we finally found a proof of that. So for the illustration, again, in the plane, we can have three measures and then a hypercube in the plane that would just be a square. So we can find a square such that in the inside of this square, we're going to have exactly half of each mass. And again, we could have kind of degenerate hypercubes. So a hyperplane, we also consider to be a hypercube. All right, let me give you a sketch of the proof. 
So first of all, we somehow want to bring Stiefel manifolds into the game. So what we're going to do, uh, again, the illustration is always going to be uh, for the planar case, but the idea is generalized. So we're going to attach a plane to the North Pole of a two-dimensional sphere. And then we're going to look at the Stiefel manifold of all three frames in R3. So these three vectors. And now we're going to look at what this gives us in this plane that we attached. So using stereographic projection, well, the red thing is actually just going to give us a point. Right? And then from this point, with the green and the blue vector, we can actually get two orthogonal vectors attached to this point that we get from the red vector. Now, this is true if this red vector is completely on the northern hemisphere. right? If the red vector points to the equator, well, we, we get a red point at infinity, kind of. And of course, if the red point is on the southern hemisphere, we're just going to interpret this as getting the same point, but kind of negatively. So we get this negative point, which I'm going to draw as kind of this circle as opposed to the field dot. OK, so well, from the Stiefel manifold V33 in the plane, we now get points with two orthogonal vectors attached, where we have to take some care of whether the point is positive or negative or might be at infinity. OK, so this is the setting that we're in. And we want to be able to define some test map. And so we're in V33, so we can map to, a, to an R2 times an R1, and I guess times an R0, but this one I didn't draw because maps to R0 just maps to a point, so they're kind of boring. And so we now want to have this equivariant map to this space where the zeros are going to be the solutions that we care about. OK, so let's try and uh, construct such a map. So we're first going to start in the case where this, this green vector here points towards the origin. So kind of, or, or away from the origin. So where the origin lies on the line spanned by the green vector. And in this case, what are we going to do? Well, we're just going to start at our red point. And we should do something that is invariant of the exact direction of the red and the blue, uh, the blue sorry, of the green and the blue vectors, because we only wanted to change signs whenever we flip the red. Vector. So what we're going to do is we're going to start blowing up a square, or in general, a hypercube, which is just defined by these directions that we have and centered at the red point. And we're going to blow this up until we have bisected with this the first of our three masses, or in general, the first of our d plus one masses. So that's just going to be a unique stopping point where we can start where we can stop growing this hypercube. OK, and now we're going to look at all of the other masses. And we're just going to see, OK, how much of these masses is inside the hypercube? And how much of these masses is outside of the hypercube? And we're going to do the same thing as we did for the ham sandwich. We're just going to subtract those two numbers. So if all of those are 0, well, then we're done. Right. Good. So this defines this map for the case where we have this red point and actually the red positive point. So whenever the original vector was pointing it to the upper hemisphere. Well, what do we do when we point to the southern hemisphere? Well, we just turn things around. We just swap the definition of inside and outside. And we're going to see how much lies outside and subtract how much lies inside. So that defines the other side. And we obviously get this very nice antipodality. And now at infinity, so kind of when the red vector was pointing on the equator, we will have to see what happens there. So let's look at this case where now this red point kind of lies to the infinity, but still the green vector points to the origin. Well, in this case, the hypercube actually degenerates to a hyperplane and we can, and the blowing up this hypercube just corresponds to translating a hyperplane. So again, there's going to be a unique stopping point. And the inside of the hypercube is going to be whatever is in this picture to the left. And the outside is what is going to be to the right. 
Now, what is the antipodality in this case? Well, it's just the same, but the red point lies on the opposite direction at infinity. And we're actually going to get the same degenerate hypercube, which is just a hyperplane, but now the inside and outside sides again have swapped. So this antipodality that we have, it just works and it goes through at infinity. So this defines a continuous function uh, where the zeros are indeed the solutions that we want. The only problem being that so far we have only defined this whenever this green vector was pointing to the origin. So what happens if we rotate? Well, in this case, uh, at least for the first map, we're just going to do whatever. We're going to do something that is continuous and antipodal. So we're just going to take this partial function and somehow continuously expand it. And we don't care what it is, as long as it's continuous and antipodal. And it could even be 0. We really don't care. Because that is where the second function that we haven't used so far comes in. And the second function is the one that depends on the blue vectors. So what are we going to do? Well, let's look at this line that is spanned by the green vector. The origin now does not lie on this line. So it lies on some side of the line. And this line has a positive and a negative side. And what we call positive and negative, we can depend on the direction of the blue vector. So depending on whether the blue vector points towards uh, if, yeah, on the inside, on the outside. And now the function that we can define is, well, we're just going to take the distance from the origin to this green line with a plus or a minus, depending on whether it is on the positive or on the negative side. So this is still continuous. It is antipodal with respect to flipping the blue vector. It does not matter what the other vectors are doing. And of course, it's going to be 0 if and only if the origin lies on the green line. And so with these functions, well, we get the following. We have some continuous functions. We know that a 0 exists. Now, because the second function, this distant thing, is 0 in this solution, we know that we are going to be in a case where we defined these blowing up of the hypercube. And in this case, the blowing up of the hypercube was done in such a way that we know that this hypercube, which was the one that already bisected the first mass, now also defines all of the remaining masses. And so in total, we get that these d plus 1 masses are simultaneously bisected. All right, so I guess that's uh, significantly more complicated than the ham sandwich proof. But the underlying concepts are the same, despite the constructions and the topological results being somewhat more complicated. OK, so kind of to summarize this first part, uh, I see that there is a question in the chat. Yeah, let me read it out loud. So ah. any thoughts about how this result might change if you used a hyper rectangle where different side lengths are allowed instead of a hypercube? And that's a um, question from Ethan Berkov. OK, so let me give the, the trivial answer first, which is, well, if you allow hyper rectangles instead of hypercubes, you can still do d plus 1 masses because a hypercube is also a hyper rectangle. Um, I think if you really want to specify at least the ratios of the side length, I, the, the same proof should go through. So I guess the, the interesting question is, well, can you do even better if you allow any kind of ratios of the side length? And there the answer is no, because whenever you take something that is convex, you are never going to be able to do better than d plus 1. Just by, well, whenever you have just take d plus 2 measures, which are kind of point-like, where you have d plus 1 of them at the corners of a simplex and one of them in the interior of the simplex, well, you're going to need to be cutting through every single one of these masses. But if you have something convex, you're going to have to contain the interior of the simplex, so there's no chance of cutting through the last one of those. So whenever you do anything convex, um, you're not going to be able to do better than d plus 1. Yeah. 
So that's a very nice question. Um, in fact, the, the general motivation for that is that one thing that we believe is that this D plus one should probably always be possible with any type of homothet of a given simply connected and compact set. And we have some ideas how to do this, but I mean, it, it gets significantly more complicated, unfortunately. So yeah, D plus one in general is, is the best you can do in these kind of scenarios. Are there any other questions? I mean, now is a very good uh, moment for questions because I am kind of at a stopping point. So I'm just gonna continue with this interlude, but if there's any questions, just feel free to shout or put them in chat or whatever. So yeah, I mean, we have seen that these mass partitions are inherently related to problems in equivariant topology. And in fact, a lot of, at least in my opinion, although I'm of course a bit biased, uh, interesting results in equivariant topology have been motivated by questions from mass partitions. Um, and so, yeah, in particular, they have led to several generalizations and variants of, of the Bosuk-Ulam theorem. But there's also other methods that people have used. So some things you can prove with simple degree arguments. There's a bunch of papers out there that use characteristic classes to show that certain sections have to vanish and so on. There is some approaches where you show that, well, if you're in sufficiently general position, it holds, and then you use some perturbation arguments. So there's a lot of other arguments that people use, but many of them are very topological. And there's many open problems. So I mentioned this uh, conjecture with the hyperplane arrangements. I just mentioned uh, our idea on general homothets. Um, yeah, I mean, another question that I have no answer for that I find interesting is let's say I give you a torus in R3. This torus has like an inside and an outside so that you, you could use this for bisections. How many masses can you do with the torus? I have no idea. So there's a lot of very interesting questions in this area. All right, so that was the mass partition part. And I think I'm gonna go over to the second part, which is gonna be somewhat shorter. So if you looked at the time, don't worry, second part is gonna be shorter, which is the helitype theorems. And well, helitype theorems are named after Helly's theorem, which is in turn named after Edouard Helly, who proved it. So Helly's theorem, um, from 1923, so it's 100 years old now, at least the publication. I think he already proved it uh, in 1913, but then there was a world war that came in between and he was in some prisoner of war camp, so he couldn't publish it. So it took him some time to actually publish it. But uh, it's also a very famous theorem in discrete geometry. And it says that if you have some finite family of compact convex sets in R to the D, such that any D plus one of them have a common intersection, well, then all of them have a common intersection. I put the finite and the compact into brackets here because you can actually throw out one of the two of them and the statement's still gonna hold. Um, so yeah, let's see here, I have a bunch of convex sets in the plane. And if I look at these three, they're gonna have a common intersection. If I look at these three, they have a common intersection these three as well. And if any three of them have a common intersection, well, then it turns out that you can find a point. So this X that lies in all of them. Now, already Heli himself, a few years later, kind of generalized this into a more topological setting, which is the following. If you have a good cover with the same thing. So a good cover being some, let's still say compact sets in a, uh, R to the D and the good cover means that any non-empty intersection has to be contractible. And then it's enough to have this Halley theorem. And this one actually has a very nice and easy proof that just uses the nerve theorem and some very basic homology. So for that, let's say, what is a nerve? Nerve is just a simplicial complex with the ground set F. So for every set, we're gonna place a vertex and then we're gonna have a simplex whenever the intersection is non-empty. So if two of the sets intersect, we're gonna put an edge between the corresponding vertices. If some seven sets have a common intersection, we're gonna put a six dimensional simplex between the corresponding seven points and so on and so forth. And so what Halley's theorem actually says is, well, this nerve should just be the full dimensional simplex, right? There should not be any missing faces. 
And let's now see what the condition says. Well, we have that any d plus one of them intersect. That just means that our d skeleton is going to be complete, right, by definition. And if the d skeleton is complete, well, that also means we're not going to have any low dimensional homology in any subcomplex, in any induced subcomplex, right? On the other hand, we have the NERF theorem. And the NERF theorem for good covers tells us that the NERF is homotopy equivalent to the union of sets, right? And now the union of sets, they are in R to the D. So we're not gonna have enough space to get any higher dimensional homology. And so in particular, all the homology groups or in dimension D and higher, they're also gonna vanish. And that's also true for every induced subcomplex, right? Because it's true for any subset of the set family. And so in particular, if you combine these two statements together, that just shows that any subcomplex of the nerve is gonna have trivial homology. And that just means, well, we cannot have any missing face because if we had a missing face, we could just look at the vertices that induce this missing face and we will get some homology there. So that just means there is no missing face, which means that the nerve has to be a full dimensional simplex. And that proves this topological version of Halley's theorem. Uh, I don't think that was his original proof, but it's one that I like a lot because it's very short. All right, uh, one variant that people have studied is the following setting due to Marilyn Breen from 1990, where she, instead of looking at intersections of sets, wanted to look at unions of sets. And she found this very nice um, statement, which just says, well, same setting, compact sets in RD, and now the union of any at most D plus one of them is contractible. Then it still holds that all of them have a common intersection. Um, you can show that this is equivalent to the topological Halley theorem. And in fact, the proof that I showed you before, it just goes through. Because union of them being contractible, that just says, well, there is no homology. And so we again, by the conditions, get that no induced subcomplex is going to have any homology. And so we're done. That is also not uh, how Green proved it but it's the same proof that works for both statements. Um, there has been a recent, very nice and very powerful generalization of this due to Luis Montejano that was in 2014, which is much, much more general. So here we have a finite set of, and, and now for technical reason, we're gonna take them to be open, but if you have compact sets, you can kind of look at their interiors and uh, hand wave your way around. But for here, let's just take them to be open, it makes things easier of some topological space. We don't care which one. And we want that for any subfamily of size J, the J minus second homology of the union vanishes. That's the only condition that we put on these sets. Then all of the sets have a common intersection. And so this uh, implies Green's theorem, right? Because there, First of all, if we're in R to the D, then at some point this uh, J minus two gets too large and we get the trivial homology anyway. And so we only need to care about sizes up to at most um, D plus one. And so if we say that any of those are contractible, then in particular also the relevant homology is gonna be zero, right? So this is much, much more general than that. And the proof is actually also very beautiful. Uh, and it uses the Maya-Viatore sequence. So whenever you're teaching the Maya-Viatore sequence and you're looking for a nice example, that is one that you could use. Um, we're going to prove this by induction. So first of all, let's look at the case that M equals to two. Well, in that case, we just want to show that two open sets with connected union have a non-empty intersection. And I mean, that's something that I guess all of you are going to believe. So let's go straight to the inductive step. So let's say that it holds for M minus one and we wanna to go to M. And so we have M sets and we somehow wanna reduce it to the case where we only have M minus one sets in our family. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take the first two sets. So let's say A zero and A one, and we're gonna replace it by their intersection. Right. And then if the remaining set family has non-empty intersection, then also 
The other thing has non-empty intersection because the intersection of the sets is exactly the same, right? Okay, and now let's write down the Maya Viatoris sequence for the pair where the first one is just a union where we take all the remaining ones and a zero. And the second one is some remaining ones and a one. Okay, so this will cover the relevant space. And we're gonna write down Maya Viatoris. So first we're gonna look at the union. And then we go to one dimension lower homology of the intersection and the intersection, um, I, I mean, I skipped a step here, but if you write things down and you apply some elementary set theory, you can see that the intersection of those two things, you can just write as the intersection of A0 and A1, union, the rest. And then we have uh, these two terms that are the individual parts. And now, well, the first one is just, whatever homology we have on the correct number of things, well, that is zero by assumption. And then the last terms, we have one dimensional lower homology, but we also have one fewer set in each of these terms. So again, by the original assumption, these are gonna vanish, which also means that the middle is gonna vanish. And now the middle is again, one fewer and other homology. So it shows that this new set family where we just replaced a zero and a one with their intersection, again, satisfies the conditions of the theorem, but for M minus one. And so by induction, we are done. And so that's a pretty neat application of the Maya Viatoris for some Helitech theorems, in my opinion. All right, but this thing kind of led me to the idea, okay, let's look at unions of things because maybe by looking at unions of set instead of as intersection, you might be able to say more. And so in particular, what can we say if not all of them have a common intersection? Well, we can still ask how many points do we need to pierce everything? And so we say that a point set P pierces a set family if every set contains some point of this point set. And the piercing number is just the size of the smallest point set piercing this set family. So for example, this set family here, well, you can see that we're not gonna be able to, they, they don't have a common intersection, right? Because already the blue, the green and the red one don't have. So there's no chance of piercing it with a single point, but it turns out we can pierce it with two points as for example here. So here in this example, the piercing number will be two. And in this kind of language, well, Halley's theorem just gives you a sufficient condition for the piercing number to be one. And well, now you can ask, are there some Halley type theorems for larger piercing numbers? And of course you will probably not be able to phrase these as kind of intersections because the intersections are just gonna vanish at some point. I mean, there are some, there's like these PQ theorems that work this way, but maybe unions are one way to phrase this. And I have some, preliminary results and idea there that I would like to talk about. So uh, let's introduce the notion of the K-level union complexity, which is, it, it looks scary, but all that we do is, well, we look at the Betty numbers of the unions and we kind of look at the worst case of those. So the K-level union complexity is the worst case Betty number that we can find in any union of some subfamily. And then the union complexity is, well, we're just gonna sum all of these up. So let me show an example. Let's look at this small set family of four sets. And let's start with the zero level union complexity. So there, well, what is the worst that we can find? We kind of wanna find a, an independent set, right? And so you see that you actually have two of these disconnected sets. So the Betty number is gonna be two. I'm working over unreduced homology here. So the zeroth um, K-level union complexity of this set family is gonna be two. Now for the first level, well, you can see that you find a cycle here in the union. And so you're actually also gonna get a Betty number one here. And so if you sum these up, you're obviously not gonna get any higher dimensional homology. So all of these Betty numbers are zero. So this thing here has union complexity three. And a general question that I have is if you have some family of open subsets of some topological space, is it always true that the piercing number is bounded from above 
by the union complexity. So far, I have not found a counterexample to this. Uh, but still, I'm not convinced enough in this to actually state it as a conjecture. But yeah. But I do have some preliminary results that I'm not going to prove here. But it's that it's true for compact sets in the plane, uh, convex sets in the plane. So if you look at uh, convex sets in the plane, then I can indeed show that union complexity is an upper bound for the piercing number. And even more, I can show that if any 2k plus 1, or at most 2k plus 1 sets have union complexity at most k, then the entire set family does. And so that is, again, some kind of heli-type theorem in some sense, because now with this, you can say, OK, if you look at any at most 2k plus 1 of these sets, you look at their union. And if the union complexity of all of these subsets is always at most k, well, then you can pierce the entire thing with k points. And in particular, if um, you plug in k equals 1, then you retrieve Helly's theorem in the plane, at least. And of course, this is all just very preliminary. And you can ask, well, does this generalize to other types of sets in the plane? Does this generalize to higher dimension? And there's a bunch of open and at least in my opinion, interesting questions. All right, so that was the second part about Helly theorems. And so just to conclude the entire thing, um, there's many applications of topological methods. I just showcased kind of two possible directions. There's a lot more there. Um, but in particular, I think many of these classical theorems by now have very short and beautiful proofs using topology. So both the ham sandwich theorem, but also Helly's theorem using the nerve theorem. I think these are very short proofs. And these kind of topological ideas, they have led to many powerful generalizations. Uh, it's a very active area of research. Um, I think I have seen some kind of a chart just for the mass partitions, like the number of papers that people have published on mass partitions. And there really has been an explosion in the last five years. It is very interesting to see. And yeah, if you're interested in any of these type of things, feel free to talk to me. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm open for questions. Uh, so thank you, Patrick. So maybe um, I would invite everyone to unmute themselves and give a round of applause for our speaker today. Um, yeah, and now it's time for questions. Patrick, so I had a question. You, you mentioned how you know um, spheres can uh, equipartition d plus one sets in d dimensional space, and then you prove okay. the same thing for for hypercubes. And then I was going to ask if if you would conjecture the same thing for any convex body besides a sphere yes. or a hypercube. But it seems you're you're going to conjecture the same thing for any sort of homothetic family. So that's scaling family of yeah. any. What do you say? Simply connected. I'm not even sure if we're going to need that. I mean, the only thing is that it needs to be something that is allows for more than just the hyperplanes. Because right. for those, we can only do D. I see. We haven't quite figured out where we want to set that boundary. But yeah, I would any any kind of like growing family that you can start at the point and kind of grow around and turn and move should okay. maybe work, but... I, I don't want to give uh, two concrete conjectures, seeing that I'm recorded. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Quite interesting. So maybe I should say uh, for this question, actually, for these type of growing and moving things, if if we do something similar on a two sphere, then we can show it for three masses. But it's not entirely clear. I mean, uh, the definition that we currently have, I find very unnatural, so I didn't mention it, but it's some kind of a well-defined growing process around the point on the sphere, then it always works. But the methods that we use, at least so far, they don't generalize to higher dimensions, and they don't really give us anything nice after projection. Yeah. Wait, I see that you'll see. Oh, sorry, yes, yes. yes. Muted. Yossi, please go ahead and ask. <laughs> um, 
Do you see many applications and interactions going the other way from discrete and geometry into kind of topology for things? I'm kind of thinking more like TDA stuff. That is a very, very loaded question that <laughs> goes goes a lot into uh, certain research proposals that I'm currently writing. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I have a, a bunch of ideas there. So, I mean, in, in particular, one thing that I find interesting, um, let me go to the next slide because that actually relates to that. So one thing you can use is the so-called center point theorems, which are related to Halley's theorem, which is kind of like, okay, you can find a point that is very central in uh, some high dimensional point set. So you can kind of view this as a generalized median, but which has, and then it has a combinatorial definition. So it's very robust against outliers. And it's very related to Halley type theorems to topological methods and seeing that these things are robust against outliers, but I mean, they don't really capture a lot of the shape. And on the other hand, TDA captures a lot of the shape, but it's not robust against outliers. Maybe there might be some way to combine these ideas to, well, I guess in the good case, get something that captures shape and is robust against outliers or in the bad case, get neither, but hopefully the good case. Um, but that is just one idea. Uh, I think there's a lot of, current approaches where people try to use some more of the underlying geometry and combinatorics of, of data and try to bring them into the TDA pipeline. Um, but I think there's there's people that know more about this than me, but I definitely see some potential of like general geometric transversals at least in there. Thanks. And that was definitely a very loaded question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, my answer was also much shorter. I could probably talk for an hour on this, but uh, in the interest of everybody's time, I'm not going to do that. But if you're interested in discussing more about this, um, feel free to contact me. Um, so do we have more questions for Patrick? Maybe one more for the recording, and then uh, like uh, the rest can be offline. Okay, so yeah, so in that case, uh, so thanks again, Patrick. I'm going to stop the yeah. here and then uh, we can take que uh, further questions offline.